Welcome to the Contrarians, and tonight we are doing another in the Dark Horse album series. Now, this record's a little bit controversial. I mean, this is one of those Stones albums. This is not one of those Stones albums that I go to. This is released in 19, what's 1976? This is the Rolling Stones, Black and Blue. This is one of those transition albums. Mick Taylor left the previous record. Now we've got Ronnie Wood. Now, this is one of those records where Ronnie Wood's on here, but he does more vocals than anything. This was the record that they used to try out guitar players. So I don't know what that means to the casual listener. Not much, probably. But this is the record where they were auditioning guitar player so just leave it at that so pretty much the whole record is keith richards playing guitar so this came out in 1976 this is the second album that uh ronnie i mean uh keith richards and mick 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 uh mick jagger produced as the glimmer twins um and like i said it came between it's only rock and roll love you live and some girls so it's a transitional record the reviews for this, we look back in the reviews over the years. All Music gave it three stars. Robert Criscow, who hates everything, and I always say that, gave it an A minus. He liked it, of course, you know, and all he likes is like the talking heads and stuff like that. Um, Rolling Stone album guy gave it three stars. Village Voice gave it A minus. Of course, the Village Voice would love it. Um, but it's kind of one of those records that the Rolling Stones fans. It's kind of like a one of those records where some people think it's great, but it's not a great Stones record, but it's an okay Stones record. It's it's the best. I will say this. It is probably the best recorded Stones album in the catalog. It sounds phenomenal. The playing's great, but I don't know, is the songwriting there. So what we're going to do is throw it out to our panel. And I want to say, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. And I do have a question before we get started. Whose topic was this? Is any, it was Brendan. Okay, good. Because this is one of those Patreon. If you're interested in being on the panel, we have a Patreon down below and you can join that. You too could be on one of these panels and you too could discuss music with us. So this is one of our Patreon. We throw out a question or we throw out topics every month and the Patreon members can submit topics. This month, Br Brendan was the winner. And since he was a winner, I'm going to start out with him too. See what happens when you submit a topic, Brendan. So anyway... Yeah. So what we want to do is look at this record. It's often misunderstood. It's one of those Rolling Stone records where people just kind of shove it to the side. But we're going to look at Rolling Stone's Black and Blue from 1976. And to start out, let's start out with Brendan. Brendan, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, you threw out this topic. What was it about this record that made you want to uh, submit this? Or what's your thoughts on it in general? So the Stones are my favorite uh, favorite band of all time. Um, I've always thought that Beggar's Banquet through Exile on Main Street is one of the best run of albums of all time, hands down. Um, I just love not everything, but most things that the Stones do, I just absolutely love. And I just think that Black and Blue, for all the reasons you already said, it's not one. It's not an album that many people talk about. Um, they don't play a lot of the songs from this album live. Um, it was much maligned by critics and fans alike when it came out back in 1976. Um, and it's also extraordinarily experimental, but it definitely has its fans. I just thought it was the perfect fit for this series. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know, I've read a lot of, you know, I know the record. Like I said, I don't go back to it very often. It doesn't really do much to me, though I do appreciate the production. Like I said, I do think it's a great sounding record. Some people look at this record thinking that, well, it does sound great. The band is playing well, but where are the songs, you know? What's your thoughts on that, Brendan? I mean, you like this record, but is it a dark horse record for you? I mean, what makes it stand out? 
Yeah, the reason it is a Dark Horse record for me, um, this is not an album that you're going to give to somebody who doesn't really know the Stones very well and that's trying to get into them. Mm-hmm. This is not an introductory album for people trying to get into the Stones by any stretch of the imagination. It's extraordinarily experimental. It's different. It's like nothing else they've done. It's one of the more, probably the most experimental album that they have did since uh, Satanic Majesties. Uh, definitely the most experimental Whoa. album. Well, that's a pre- that's a strong statement. I'll give you that. Yeah, it, well, and experimental in a different way. You know, right. it's, it's definitely an album of its time. It's heavy on the funk. It's heavy on jazz. It's I mean, not heavy on jazz, but it's definitely got jazz moments on it. And they even did a reggae cover on it. So yeah, it's definitely a divisive album. But here's what I like about it, and this is what this is an album I do go back to um, when I want to hear a Stones album and a good Stones album, but it does the, and it's a good stones album that doesn't have any of the greatest hits on it because i think you know i love all the greatest hits we mm-hmm. all they're fantastic but we've also been beaten over the head with them by classic rock radio and pop culture i mean jesus they're in every single martin Scorsese movie um but i would like to you know you put this song this album on it's they got some great moments on it there are some great songs on this album I would say there are some it's there there are good songs on it mm-hmm. uh, and this is an album i'd like to put on when i don't want to hear any of the the, the 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 you know classic rock staples but i still want to hear a good stones album all right fair enough um i'm gonna throw it over to mr pop pop off martin what's your thoughts on this normally we start out with you but since okay. brendan was the instigator of this whole topic all right. i thought we'd let him start out but martin well i'll vehemently disagree with brendan to start with i, I don't okay I don't, good let's start this off fire i don't i don't find it that experimental i mean it's got two ballads on it which sound like standard stones ballads there's only eight songs so you've got memory motel which i love to death uh fool to cry it sounds like a stones ballad to me it's got two absolutely standard stock stone songs in hand of fate and crazy mama uh, it's got a blues on it. Sure, it's got some reggae, a little bit of disco, but, you know, some girls had shatter. We've got country tunes, disco tunes. Stones have done a lot of, you know, experimental stuff, I think, per album. I, I agree. It's a beautiful, beautiful recording. Yeah. Uh, I I love the record. I've always liked it. Um, I went on Guitar Hack, and we did a top five Stones albums, and I actually had it fifth in the entire catalog behind It's Only Rock and Roll, Exile, Tattoo You, and then Some Girls First. Um, so, you know, calling this a transitional album, uh, uh, sure. It's the first one with Ronnie. Um, I, I think it, I think it sounds kind of in the same marketplace as some girls in emotional rescue and tattoo you, uh, pretty much. Um, yeah, like I say, love the recording. There is all this, you know, uh, hot stuff with Harvey Mandel on Wawa. I, th- I thought that was almost like Fripp like and almost like a chorus pedal or something, but I guess that's him doing Wawa Billy Preston's on here as well. So that's your reggae tune. Like I say, Hand of Fate is your sort of standard Stones tune. I've always liked Cherry Oh Baby. I think that's uh, the music is so small and sparse on it. it. To me, it's like a vocal song and it's very entertaining to me. Um, um, like I said, Memory Motel is my favorite thing on it. Um, you know, I, as the wiki says, I suppose if you look at all these different stone structures or whatever, um, this is uh, generally longer, longer stone songs. And that's, I guess, why there's there's only uh, eight on here. Hey, Negrita is like a funky reggae kind of thing. Inspiration by Ron Woods. So this is one that Ron really probably more or less wrote, um, but he had the credit stolen away from him or taken away like he probably should have been in on the credit. Um, the only one I don't like is Melody on the whole thing. I just find it like a boring lazy blues just not into it at all but yeah fool to cry is fine with the falsetto and stuff crazy mamas your 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 brown sugar uh, type song um yeah i remember the controversy i remember literally it live i at, back at the time remember the ad with the with the gal hanging with her arms up yeah. and all beat black and blue and it says rolling stones beat me black and blue or something like that uh so i remember that ad that was all over the place right um but yeah cool you know gatefold I, I like the I like the photo session for it and everything and you know how everything is black and blue the black hair and yeah, you know the blue great. sky behind them and stuff yeah it's fine so I yeah I've I've always been a, a big fan of this one and um, you know 
really, like I say, I, I like the two Stonesy ones. I like I like the reggae and the and the funky one, and and I love Memory Motel. It's my favorite. So yeah, I had it fifth fifth favorite of all Stones albums. Oh, what would you rate if we're gonna? And I'm gonna ask Brendan. I'm gonna ask you this too. So Martin, if you're gonna rate this out of ten, what would you give it? Uh, I'd probably give it an eight. Okay, I'd give it an eight. Yeah. And Brendan, what would you give it? I'd probably around a seven, seven and a half. All right, we'll go seven and a half just to make it look good. I do have a question for you, Martin, since we're talking about it. A, a lot, if anyone's familiar with the whole Rolling Stones timeline, a lot of people think that this is where the cracks started to form, you know? Well, I mean, they had such a, a resurgence with some girls. I mean, some girls is super yeah, highly but rated. But do you think that that like was crazy. as good as what came before? I'm oh, just yeah. Throwing it out I, there. I do. I do. I'm, I'm you know, I, I always trend. I know it's kind of boring, but I, I trend to the late 70s with a lot of these bands. But I love okay. Exile and I love It's Only Rock and Roll. That whole period's great, too. But and and ta tattoo you is a highly rated album too. So you know I I remember emotional rescue got a little bit of stick at the time, right, for being right. a weak T version of some girls almost, right. Uh, but you're right, this one was kind of ignored. It only went platinum. It was like not you know is is it, other things were more important. Fleetwood Mac was blowing up. The Eagles were big. Zeppelin was still around, right. So it was a little bit you know ah oh, we got to change a guitarist again sort of thing and. And, uh, you know, as Brandon, as Brandon said, you know, there were, there's, this is a, this is a, uh, an album you can go to cause there was little, there's really no hits on it. Right. So it's no, th can... this record, if you look at yeah. FM rock radio and I always throw that out there because why not? No one, there's nothing off this record that's ever played. I don't think I've ever heard anything off of this ever played on the radio. Now, someone else here may have, but I've never heard. It's just totally neglected. I'm just saying. So I think I think I may have heard Fold and Cry at least a couple times. All right. Um, because that was the big hit. But it's a number 10 hit, that one, right? So yeah. But still, they neglect it here. In central Ohio, you don't hear it. All right, cool. All right, Brendan. Thank you, Martin. Let's throw it over to Kevin T and get his thoughts on this. So, Kevin, what's your thoughts on black and blue? Is this a dark horse record? What's your thoughts? Well, I guess first I have a confession is I, I never heard the full album until about two days ago. I well, at least you're honest. Yeah. I've listened to it about six, seven times since then. And, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the classic period, you know, Beggar's Banquet up through Go Goat's Head Soup, I'd say. Um, kind of this middle period is where I get lost. And then I come back, um, Emotional Rescue and Tattoo You, I like a lot. Um so yeah, I'll just run down. I, I agree a lot with what Barton said on, uh, you know, Hand of Fate and Crazy Mama could fit right in with any of those classic uh, period albums. You know, it could have been on Exile or Sticky Fingers. Um, Hot Stuff is, you know, that kind of funky R&B vibe. Kind of a strange opener for me. Um, I would have thought they would have went with something more classic to open. It's, it's, it's kind of jarring at first if, it, if you don't know the album. Mm -hmm. um, Cherry O Baby, that's the one I really dislike. Uh, I even went and listened to the original, and they don't really do a lot new with it. It just seemed like that's something Keith was into at the time, and he wanted to record it, and, you know, somebody gave in and let him do it. <laughs> um, Memory Motel, I like a lot. Um, it gets a little repetitious, but you get that a lot with the songs on this album, and it, you can when you read about the history of it and uh, you know, how they were auditioning uh, guitar players, it seems like a lot of these songs just turned into long jams to see, you know, mm -hmm. what, what the players could bring to it, you know, and, and, and they're, they're less songs and more jams, um, which is fine. Um, I would prefer a little tighter songs. Um, it, you know, you can even tell in the lyrics sometimes where, uh, Mick is just kind of repeating things and things are going over and over, but it's okay. Um, hey, Negrita, that one's okay. Uh, kind of slower, plotting, rocker. Um, it sounds stozy, stonesy, but again, the lyrics to me seem a little lazy, like they were just jamming, like we just talked about. Melody, um, I think that's the big Billy Preston one. Um, I, I think he actually brings a lot to this album. And like you said, this is a very well-recorded album. I even 
I was just streaming it this week and I, I picked up on that right away. Like it, you could pick out every instrument and the layers were there and they, they it, were interwoven and mixed really well. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in for a second. I love the uh, Charlie's symbols. The symbols are just, poosh, you know, they're so beautiful. And they just, and, and Memory Motel's got this opening fill that's really nice with the big, beautiful sounding symbols. Yeah, exactly. Um, Fool to Cry is the one I knew. Um, and I, I always like that song. I think that's the best song in the album. That's a classic uh, Stones ballad. And, uh, you know, again, Crazy Mama, that's... Uh, that's probably the most up tempo song. Sounds large, you know. Sounds like you know that 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 classic exile period, you know, where you got a bunch of people in the studio contributing, and it just sounds like a you know, it's a real anthemic kind of rocker. Um, when you listen to this album, you know, after that kind of classic period, it does sound like a bit a bit of a big turn. I would agree it's experimental, but I don't know if it, I would say it's very creative. I think that's where I get lost a little bit. It just sounds like they were into auditioning these players and jamming. And I think I even read that Mick said, you know, they were on a bit of a holiday with this album. You know, they weren't, they weren't invested in the creative process. Um, definitely sounds like, uh, you know, like I said, sound one of their best sounding albums. Um, I do wonder what it would sound like without Billy Preston so prominent on the album. To me, he's, he took a, he, he played a big part in the album, yeah. but overall, okay. I would, I would probably give it a six and a half out of 10. Six and a half. Yeah. All right. So, so Brendan, this, this is mostly recorded at music land, right? I actually don't know where I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I've just looked on the wiki. I mean, there's a few different studios. I mean, stones, it's so hard to tell, right? Usually, but Rolling sounds, Stones sounds Mobile. Like the way they, they said it, it, it was music land, um, you know, which is a, a story. Great studio. But I'm, I'm just trying to understand why it sounds so good because it really does. I mean, Glenn Johns was one of the engineers who else engineered this. Uh, I just saw it. Well, Glenn Johns is one name. I'll give you that. But yeah, Kevin, I'm just Rolling curious. Stones, Mobile, Rotterdam, Mountain mm -hmm. Recording, Montreux, overdubs, it says. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was more or less music land. Yeah. So, Kevin, real quick. So if you listen to this record, as we know, this is one of those records where they are auditioning guitar players. Do you look at this as being more of a group effort or do you think it's much more of a Keith Richards thing? Because, you know, we're auditioning guitar players. I don't know. It doesn't sound so much like a group effort to me, but I was just curious what you thought about it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I read a little bit about who played on what, but uh, I mean, obviously on Hot Stuff, you can tell that's not Keith playing the the solo on it. Um, right. I, yeah. I mean, it still sounded like he was really invested in the guitar playing on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. Uh I guess it does sound like a group effort, but it, there are parts where you can really pick out where, you know, uh, Billy took over or, uh, like I said, the solo on hot stuff was right. just pretty different. Um, yeah. yeah I, Keith was never my favorite lead player anyways. So, well, yeah, I think I back in the old days, good. I think Brian Jones was the lead guitar player. I don't right. think Keith, Keith was just a rhythm player, you know? Yeah, it, it's a very rhythm-heavy album, yeah. and it sounds that way, yeah. Yeah, so which it, is fine. Probably his biggest contribution. Yeah, but 6.5, okay, that's fair. That's fair it, enough. It's, a, it's, it's growing. When I first listened to it, I didn't care for it much, but I just kept listening, and right. it's getting up there. If you want to round it up to 7, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. Well, I could round it up to 7 if that's what, if that's what you're going with. All right, cool. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Let's bounce it over to Tate. Tate, he, as I've been alerted to, he's our youngest youngest member on the panel. I'd like to see what uh, Tate has to say about the Rolling Stones, Black and Blue. What you got? So I have a uh, I have a very interesting history with this album. Um, I I've been a Stones fan for a long time. I mean, I've only been on this earth 24 years going on 25, but, um, I, uh, I, I've been listening to the Rolling Stones since middle school and a lot of 
my exposure to their music came from the Hot Rocks compilation. And it wasn't really until high school when I started getting into their albums. And uh, I remember for a good portion of my high school uh, career and my um, and some time into college, Some Girls was my favorite Stones album. And then one day I was looking on the internet. I'm like, oh, black and blue. I, I, I knew Fool to Cry from one of the, you know, from one of the greatest hits albums, but I don't think I ever gave this album a chance. So I listened to it and I absolutely loved it. And I'm like, this is really good. How come nobody talks about this? Um, Cause it opens <laughs> up with hot stuff, which, mm-hmm. which is this funky hypnotic, song with this you know great riff and charlie watson bill wyman as a rhythm section as a drummer myself yeah. um who, who's played since uh you know elementary school i'm a sucker for a great rhythm section charlie watts has always been one of my favorite drummers and i think him and bill wyman always made a really tight but loose rhythm section i think hot stuff really really shows the strength of the two of them together um hand of fate is one of my favorite rolling stone songs of all time terrific riff terrific solo from uh harvey mandel i believe that this is harvey mandel playing the solo on it if my uh memory serves me correctly um great vocal harmonies from mick and keith i mean you can just tell from the recording that mick and keith are having a great time singing on this song and i do want to bring special mention to the version on the live at the elmo combo uh album that they put out i want to say like late last year sometime where they played like a where if my member serves me correctly they played a small show at the Elmo Combo Club in Toronto, where uh, which I'm sure, sure is a venue that Martin might be all too familiar with. Um, and I think April Wine opened up that. We just talked about that tonight, Tate. Really? Yes, they op- really? Yeah, we were doing, awesome. We were doing and, the live and, albums of April Wine, so we talked yeah, about Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and April Wine have a, um, have a live album that was recorded from their yeah. from that uh, set that they played, and it was put out, you know, around the same time that that happened, which is also really good. So if you want if, if you want context, listen to the uh, April Wine at the Elmo Combo, then listen to the Rolling Stones at the Elmo Combo. But the, the version of Hand of Fate on that particular release just sees them... I don't know what was going up on that stage, but man, the magic was there. And Billy Preston is just playing yeah. his his ass off mm-hmm. on, on the piano, just just going just going crazy. And uh, I want to say that that's probably Ronnie Wood b- b- busting up the the two solos on that particular version. I might be wrong, but from what I can hear, and I'm not going to I'm not a guitar player, so I'm not really the best judge of this. But from what I hear on that particular version, that's Ronnie Wood. I can't say enough good about that live album and that version of Hand of Fate. So Hand of Fate, one of my favorite Stone songs of all time. Cherry O Baby, uh, I think, is a really well done cover of uh, of a reggae tune. Uh, apparently, it was done by some guy named Eric Donaldson, who I'm not really sure who that is. And again, I want to bring special mention to Charlie Watts. He's not a reggae drummer, but I think he he plays he he does it his interpretation of reggae pretty pretty well, doing the the bass drum in the the weird places and doing the 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 um the cross sticks as well. Um, and I want to say that it would influence uh, Mick Jagger to do that uh, that song that uh, he did with Peter Tosh, which um, which the name of it escapes me. Um, so Cherry O Baby, um, I think, is really well done. Memory Motel was probably my favorite Stones ballad. Um, I, I, I some people complain about it for being too long. I think that it's perfectly fine the way it is. I love uh making keith's uh harmonies in the chorus and i love uh keith uh, keith richards's part is my favorite um part of the song i always look forward to it and and really really soulful uh um keyboards from billy preston and a great pocket from charlie uh pocket i'm sorry from from charlie watts hey negrita not really much to say there really cool funky song uh that's catchy with a great pocket um just kind of uh 
repeats itself for the four and a half minutes or whatever it is. Um, Melody, Melody is the one song on here that I find to be kind of boring. I, it reminds me of that song "Hide Your Love" from Goat's Head Soup. Um, but I think "Hide Your Love" has like a uh, kind of a you know charm to it. Melody doesn't really hit strike that same chord for me, um, but it does have a charm, and it you know it's and it's got some um, some pretty good vocals on it as well. Uh, "Fool to Cry" was the big hit. Uh, you know, great soulful Billy Preston keyboards I have in my notes here, soulful. Um, and it's a really, uh, um, it has a really cool funky jam uh, at the end where Charlie Watts is playing uh, the 16th notes on the hi-hat and doing the barks there, I think is really well done. Um, and then uh, Crazy Mama, I like Martin said, kind of kind of reminded him of Brown Sugar. It reminds me of Brown Sugar too. I think it's a really good way to close out the album. Um, you know, catchy mid tempo. You know, great great park pocket from from Charlie and Bill. Great vocals from Jagger. Not really much to say about it other than it's just a typical Stones tune that we really know and love. And overall, uh, I think this is a criminally underrated Rolling Stones album. I love it. It's a nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. So okay. I'm just curious. And Tate, I was going to say that was a great review. If you look at this record compared to the, like that classic period from Mick Taylor, do you think that this just fits right in with those records? Do you think this is a bit of a departure? Do you feel when you listen to this record, we're heading into a new era? I don't know. How do you look at this compared to the what came before? Uh, you know, I would say that it's similar to the Mick Taylor era where, um, I, I find more in similarity with Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll because for me, Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll had those one or two songs that are kind of like, they're still good, but they're like, eh, you know, um, and this album has that with melody, but at the same time, it excites me because I know that just around the corner, two years later after this album came out, even better things were were common for him in the form of some in the form of some girls, and you know maybe not so much with with emotional rescue, although I really think that emotional rescue is pretty underrated too, and tattoo yeah. you and, and um those albums too, uh but to to answer your question I think that there's some similarities with the uh with the the kind of the latter Mick Taylor era but there's experiment the experimentation what there is on this particular release is going to be explored even more on some girls with miss you and far away eyes mm -hmm. and shattered and when the whip comes down and, and songs like that well excellent so you think this is an improvement over goat's head soup or it's only rock and roll I wouldn't say an improvement. I think it's uh, because I hold Goat's Head Soup and it's like rock and roll in really hard regard too. So I'd probably say that it's that it's up there. Okay. It's kind of both. Cool. Fair the, enough. Fair enough. The, all those three other are the uh, the same. Excellent. All right, Tate. Cool. Very well done. John the Music Nut. How are you? Nice to see you. What's your thoughts on this one? Uh, thanks so much for having me, guys. So this album here this was from 1976 you know that in the states they put out six studio albums in the 1970s and every one of them hit number one okay now okay all right i'll accept that right now this album as we've all said this was a transitional album they're trying out guitar player they're going between harvey mandel Wayne Perkins and Ron Wood. There's very eclectic album, as we've all said. Hot Stuff is just a funk jam. And it's just that same rhythm, and it only changes key when Harvey Mandel plays that solo. And when you hear that solo, it does sound different than anything else they've ever done. And in my opinion, even though it's a cool jam, I don't think his style worked for the band. I don't, and I think that's why they didn't bring him on. Now, Although I do like the song. And yes, this album is more on jams than it is on songs. Now, Hand of Fate, I think, is a great underrated rock song. One of their most underrated rock songs. I wish we heard this more. 
on AOR back in the day when you heard a lot of Stone songs on the radio. The next song is Cherry Old Baby. Now, what's interesting about this song is this is when they really started flirting with reggae and they decided they liked reggae. Tate, the song you were talking about is You Gotta Walk, Walk Don't Look Back by Peter Tosh. Yeah. Which was okay. Now, that was on Peter Tosh's album, Bush Doctor, which was on Rolling Stone's record. And that gave Peter Tosh's career a big push here in the States. Yeah. And then later on, they keep going back to this sound, like on Send It to Me off Emotional Rescue. Too rude off a of dirty work. You don't have to mean it off a of bridge to Babylon. So they keep going back to this. I mean, they really enjoy playing this, and I think this is where they really discovered that. Now, Memory Motel, that's the centerpiece. That is a is a closet classic. It is a fantastic song. In my opinion, this should have been the single. They, AM was the big format in the States back in 1976. You cut this down from a seven-minute song, which doesn't feel seven minutes because it brings you in. You cut it down to a three-and-a-half-minute song. This is an AM radio hit, and you still hear it now. That's how I feel about it. I love this song so much. I love the, I love mixed vocal performance on here. I love the guitar lines. I love the chorus. This is an excellent track. Next track... Hey, Negrita, that's a cool jam that Ron Wood brought in, even though it says inspired by Ron, Ron Wood. Well, and yeah, you know what that means. Exactly, right? I like that. Melody, I echo all your sell- sentiments on this. And yes, Billy Preston is all over this album, but, you know, outside of those little horns coming in for a few seconds, it's pre- just pretty much a straight R&B, R&B jam. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's... It's good for what it is, but you know, it does get repetitive after a while. I never liked Fool to Cry. I think the only reason this song hit number 10 in the States was because it was done by the Rolling Stones. I think it was based on momentum and momentum alone. I think there's a reason why in the glory days of adult-oriented rock, you never heard this song. If you want to hear this song, you pick up Black and Blue, or when I was in high school, I... I picked up Rewind, which was a greatest hits album released by them in 1984. And that's how I heard Fool to Cry. I just think, I think compared to all the other singles they did in the 1970s, this comes up way short. I never cared for this song. I mean, songs usually grow on me over time. This, this one never did. Crazy Mama, I believe this song and Hey Negrita were how... Mick and Keith in particular said, okay, Ron Wood's our guy. Because just that loose feel on there, that joyous song that this is, I mean, he was the right fit. You can really tell on this song. The backing vocals on here, that's Ron Wood singing with Keith on the backing vocals as well. That is, this is a, like, Martin had said, I mean, this and Hand of Fate are more your traditional stone sound. But this song works very well. So with this album, I and you know what? The stones were very consistent. I don't think they ever made a doubt of an album. Never. And this is not my favorite Stones album. This is my least favorite album in the 1970s by the Rolling Stones. But there's still a lot to love. Memory Motel alone. Hand of Fate. Crazy Mama. Hey, Negrita. I give this a 7.5. Thank you. 7.5. So we've got an 8, a 7.5, a 7, a 9, and a 7.5. To me, that doesn't sound like a a too shabby of a record after listening to all you gentlemen talk about it. So if we calculate this, we give this whole record a 7.8 consensus, which is not too shabby. I mean, I could give my rating, but I'm just going to lie low because I don't think, I think I probably would hurt it. Um, 
you guys are much more into it than I am. But wow, what can I say? I'm just kind of, I'm well, kind of amazed. I'm surprised it got such a high rating. But I, I'd like to ask everybody. Yeah, how would you compare it to Emotional Rescue? Good question. I like because we know how great Some though. Girls is, but what about it? Yeah, that's a good question, Martin. I think Emotional Rescue is a little underrated. I would rank that an eight, easy. And that off malign title track, I've always dug that. And I love She's So Cold. And yeah. It just doesn't, it, Emotional Rescue to me just seems more like a collection of tracks as opposed to an album. Because we looked at that, I can't remember if that was on Ryan's show, someone's show, I can't remember, but we looked at Emotional Rescue, and I just recall that it just seemed like a collection of songs. And I would have to say, compared Emotional Rescue to Black and Blue, at least Black and Blue seems more like the songs go together better than, you know, Emotional Rescue. You get to a certain point in the Stones catalog, everything after Some Girls just seems like it's a compilation of stuff. And that might be a little harsh, but that's the way I. To me, this feels like sober and confident, and and emotional rescue seems a little goofy, you know. Well, yeah, there are a lot of straight up rockers on that album. It does rock harder than Black and Blue. It, there's a lot of more fast paced stuff on here where you don't really have anything fast on this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's different in that aspect. It is a harder rock and album, even though the title song is quasi disco, you know. But I, I dig that album. And I think they've made, I think they've made a lot of strong albums after this. I think some of their latter day albums are very underrated, especially Steel Wheels. The other thing is you have to consider about, about Emotional Rescue is a lot of those tracks were started on Some Girls and then were rejects and they finished yeah. them up on Emotional Rescue. So there's that too, you know. I don't know. It's an okay record. I don't mind it. I can listen to it, no problem. Anybody else have any thoughts on uh, Emotional Rescue? Tate's probably sitting there going, God, I really have some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I really, I was one originally who didn't hold Emotional Rescue in that high of a regard, but after listening to it a few more times and the past few months, uh, I, I've really grown to say that it's a, uh, um, a really underrated Rolling Stones album too. Not so much in the in the sense that I feel about Black and Blue because I really think that Black and Blue is an underrated gem. Mm -hmm. um, but Emotional Rescue, uh, I mean, the, the you know you got the title track, which is, you know, like like John was saying earlier, was is quasi disco. I think it's terrific. She's so cold um, has always been one of my favorite Rolling Stones songs from since the moment I heard it. Mm -hmm. uh, Down in the Hole, I think, is a really good kind of um, blues flavored song um, that is that has a, that kind of just sucks you in. And then I thought, and then um, lastly, I thought I always thought that kind of the underrated hidden gem on that uh, album was Indian Girl. Yeah, Indian Girl is a like great Indian track. Girl. So yeah. uh, kind of a down tempo uh, ballad for, for them, which they did. Evan, Brendan, do you have any thoughts on Emotional Rescue since we're talking about it? I, I agree with a lot of what John said. I'd probably have Emotional Rescue slightly ranked slightly higher than uh, this album, Black and Blue. Just rocks a little harder, a little more consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with Martin. Go ahead. I, I like uh, Black and Blue a little bit better. Uh, like he said, it is a little bit more confident. There could be a lot of reasons for that. It could be because, like you said, Mick came out and said, yeah, we were trying, but we weren't really trying that hard. And, you know, maybe they just didn't, you know, maybe that kind of gave it the confidence, the sounding of the confidence that it, that it actually has and why I like it a little bit. Yeah, I, w I wasn't – an Emotional Rescue – it's not a bad album, but it's definitely not one that resonates me. Like the the disco y kind of sound of it, and I, I Tate, I, I disagree with you. I, I, you know, she's so cold is one of my least favorite Rolling Stone songs. Is it really? Uh, yeah. But uh, but it does sound like definitely the single off of it. It does sound like a single, and if you listen to "She's So Cold," it doesn't seem like it fits that record. That's yeah. what I always thought. You know. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that it's scrappier. I don't think Charlie sounds as good on it as he does on black and blue. And 
like I say, it's a, it's a little silly, right? Dan- dance part one, send it to me, seems really phoned in. If I remember right, I think a lot of the bass parts are Ronnie Wood on that record. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Emotional Rescue is kind of casual. She's so cold. I know casual. Emotional Rescue, Ron casual, Wood plays right? bass on it. I, I mean, I like it. It's just, it's just, uh, it, it seems a little, uh, little looser and more unraveled and a little like, hey, we're just having fun versus this album. But I think Ron Wood is a, well, of course, he played bass with Jeff Beck group. Hell of a bass player. Great bass player. Great guitar player. But I like him more of a bass player than I do a guitar player. Me personally. Because he's all over Emotional Rescue and his bass lines are just phenomenal. I'll give it that. Not trying to take anything away from Bill Wyman. But Ronnie is a bass player. Big fan. Big fan. Good on facial expressions, too. And and he is. He's got good hair, and that has a lot to do with it, you know. Well, there you go, gentlemen. I don't know. We give this record a 7.8. Does that seem like a dark horse record? Well, it doesn't sound so dark to me. But uh, I don't know. Does anybody have anything else to add before we wrap this up? The fact that we call this dark horse record 7.8 just tells you how great their catalog is. Yeah. Yeah, if this record gets a 7.8, and, you know, a lot of people don't think that much of this record. Well, that says something to how high the quality is of their catalog. Yes, you're 100% right. All right, gentlemen. I guess we don't have anything else to say. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If you're interested in these panels, you can you can join. We've got merch down below, T Public. Check out the links. Um uh, what else do we have, Martin? We've got uh, Kofi. If you want to, if you don't want to join the Patreon, you don't want to join, you can at least donate to the Kofi account and keep this program going. And we would highly appreciate it. I want to thank the panel tonight. Want to thank Tate, Kevin, John the Music Nut, and Brendan and Martin Popoff for joining because it was a great discussion on the Stones, Black and Blue. I don't think it's so much a dark horse record. But, hey, try it out. Your miles may vary. It's a great-sounding record. I'll give it that. So based on that, I want to wish everybody a good night, and we'll see you on the next show. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later. See you, gentlemen.